Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. This is Michael Waits from Asia Tech Podcast Stories. I'm with Jeffrey Handley. You know, Jeffrey, with like almost everybody else that we interviewed, you've done so many things for such a long period of time. I kind of leave it up to you to say how you want to introduce yourself, actually, if that's fair. And then I've got, a, I've got an immediate question, but go ahead. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Michael. You're very um, welcome. Really good to be talking to you today. Um, I guess as an introduction, uh, I've been in this part of the world for my whole life. Uh, I was born and brought up in Hong Kong, fifth generation, and um, have lived uh, almost across the world, basically. So from Hong Kong through Australia, New Zealand, the States, um, as well as where I am now in Shanghai and China. I have been here since uh, 2006, uh, on and off. Wow. Um, my background, really, uh, as an entrepreneur, basically, uh, my first business was in 1996 uh, in Hong Kong, um, at the beginning of the, uh, the internet boom, growth.com, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Uh, and from there, subsequently, five, uh, five businesses, um, some successes and, and, and a lot of learnings, uh, a a couple of acquisitions, um, some public market listings, IPOs, uh, and now, most recently, since my last, uh, fortunate to have my last earnout uh, in 2014, uh, we're in New York, I came back to Shanghai, and since then I've been spending a lot of time working with uh, with with younger, smarter, faster, um, <laughs> taller, Bruce. yeah, young, yeah, younger, faster, smarter, hungrier. <laughs> Uh, better looking teams um, that are that are doing awesome things and you know hoping to bring something to the table uh, you know basically 20 something plus years of mistakes uh, that they can avoid yeah uh, fair so enough. that's kind of where I am look I wanted to ask you as well where you stand because I don't know this for sure but I believe you have two other brothers at least right yes yes so I've met so two I've younger met brothers younger that's what I want to ask you where do you stand in the pantheon of the Handley brothers but you're the oldest I kind of could tell by looking yeah. at your photo yeah. Yep. So I'm uh, I'm the oldest. Uh, and I live here. The youngest one lives in uh, in Bangkok, and the middle one uh, lives in in New York. So the youngest would be all... Callum. The middle would be Derek. Yeah. Yes. That's right. Do you want to talk? So we've all worked together. Go yeah, um, you have most so... of our businesses. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting dynamic, I think. I yeah. think so. I mean, I have a brother as well. I could not like live without him. I think he's just absolutely fabulous. So if you have even close to the relationship that I have with mine, that you have with yours, you've been working with yours for 20-something years. So good for you. Yeah. You know, people often say, uh, isn't that like the worst thing in the world? Because, you know, every book I've ever read says don't work with family, da da right. da 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 And, you know, my, my whole ethos of being is really focusing not on the what's, but the why's and the how's for yeah. everything. And... For my, for our situation, I guess uh, our our whole family on both sides, generations, have worked together for themselves. Um, so it was no real surprise that uh, that we would end up doing things together. Good and so you. we started a number of businesses together. My uh, my two brothers at the moment have uh, have recently, I think maybe in the last uh, six weeks, uh, have launched a new business, uh, a new startup. Uh, and I'm I'm not in, I'm not uh, privileged enough to be involved in that one, um, but uh, no, they're they're having a good time with that, you know. Uh, cool. And so that's you know that's good. Yeah, I spent a little bit of time with both of them actually, so it was a pleasure. Now that I feel like I've met most of the family, um, I feel honored. interesting. I feel honored actually. So thank you for coming on. Do you want to talk oh, at all? So what did you guys start in 1996? I want to start early only because I want to come up to today. Yeah. So and you're running a sure. you're running a fund now as well, yeah. Yeah, so uh, just in uh, as uh, running a fund now, just building a fund, creating a fund. I've been doing uh, a lot of the uh, the investment aspect of it and pipeline aspect of it for the last year and a bit, um, and now moving on to uh, to finding uh, or to, to creating a, a larger fund around a thesis that I have that I wrote um, at the end of last year uh, and and published. Uh, the thesis is called China Matters, basically, uh, and it's around a, a macro, which we can talk later on. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, 96, uh, basically had finished uh, university uh, in New Zealand, um, and I was finished university in 95, and I was employed. My first job was with uh, Avnet, which is, I, I think they still are the largest uh, semicon uh, distributor globally. Um, so they, they're the bridge between the, the fab plants like Motorola and Qualcomm and stuff, uh, and the end, uh, the, the business customer, um, whether it's Caterpillar or uh, Nokia, et cetera, et cetera. And so I worked for them out of New Zealand, and I was lucky enough to have basically one of my first mentors, the CEO there, Selwyn Pallet, 
Super. Who sent me to Hong Kong? He sent me to the Hong Kong office um, because uh, because I could speak Chinese and because I was going home and because it was part of their their, their kind of master plan. And as a part of that job, um, they were rolling out an intranet. And this is back in '95. Wow. And so I was in charge of rolling out. I was fancy titles like a regional inf- in regional inventory intranet director or something. <laughs> and um, but no one knew what an intranet was, so it wasn't that fancy. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, I do. My parents were like, "Can you just have a really like self-explanatory job?" <laughs> yes, that was my first taste of basically the internet. And uh, after a year of that in Hong Kong. Uh, we got to about 96, 97 ish, and that's when I was part of the founding crew of uh, just basically a web startup, um, you know, a web shop that didn't really have any mind, you know, big ideas, um, like at the time, like an Amazon or a PayPal or anything, but right. knew that if you sold picks and shovels, they were going to be a, a huge gold rush. Um, luckily, managed to get out of that. Um, the exit from there was an acquisition by China.com, which was uh, Asia's first um, listed, NASDAQ listed. Um, technology entity, internet technology uh, entity. So China.com at the time was a darling uh, of the stock market and of the press. Uh, They acquired the business just weeks, literally weeks before everything um, went the way it did. Uh, So that was was a very interesting time, you know, very, very, uh, very testing, very, especially as a young, impressionable, I think, what I was like, 24 at the time. Right. Um, You know, you come straight out the gates and you basically, you, you can't put a foot wrong, right? Everything's going amazingly. And and it's a good wake-up call to realize that a lot of those successes were nothing to do with you. Uh, you had not done anything that smart or that right or that disciplined. It was just the macro force was so much bigger than you, and it was going in that direction anyway. And I think that's one of the lessons that I think a lot of the, uh, the younger founders today uh, are missing. should be aware of. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, interrupted you. You said, so the macro forces, and I think we'll get around to talking about that later. I like how you've already mentioned that word twice, twice. Macro has been sort of a big theme in my life as well. So I'm curious yeah. how you get from, you know, the founding there. of this. Yeah, so how you get there. But the story is much longer in the middle, and I'm, I'm still curious to let you keep going on yeah. with how you go from 1999. So, so after that uh, that exit, um, I – Everything was not very uh, positive, the environment, and so I left Hong Kong and decided to go and see my two younger brothers and my parents in, in New Zealand. Uh, and around that time, uh, my brothers and I were trying to figure out what to do next. Um, and one of uh, one of my best friends was uh, was in the UK at the time, and he had met these guys that subsequently what the company today is called is, is Betfair, which is the largest uh, online gambling uh, business or, or uh, gambling uh, platform in the world, uh, transacting billions and billions of dollars a day um, in, in liquidity on those pools. And met basically the founders of that, uh, you know, a two-man band at the time, basically. And um, we thought we could do something like that for the Southern Hemisphere, a peer-to-peer betting exchange, basically. Um, so we, we started that company, um, and uh, my middle brother, Jack, made that. We built that. As a part of building that, we built basically what was the first mobile betting application. Bear in mind, this was literally 2000. Right, so, so was there wasn't a lot of mobile. Today. It was very early, actually. Very little. Very few, very few things happening. Um, you know, like Palm, palm Pilots were, were, our, uh, were, our, were our inspiration. You know, right. were, were, our, were our only guide at the time. Um, the net net out of that was uh, this this little application that we built uh, ended up winning a bunch of awards um, and got the attention of of the carriers at the time who were you know the holy grail at the beginning of any kind of cycle like the ISPs were at the beginning of the, the internet. Correct. So the carriers, uh, Vodafone was the main one, um, uh, and got the attention of them, and they uh, basically put us on retainer um, to help them build out added value services uh, for their mobile subscribers uh, and their growth. And where was, was that in was that in the UK or was that globally? It was it was out of New Zealand, but wow. it was global. So wow. you know we were at that time. If you think the infrastructure was being built for mobile, the, the you know the, the backbone of it was being created, and these value added services um, when they cottoned onto a winner. Uh, in one market, they would translate that almost instantly. There was no pushback. There was very little friction. Um, it was translated instantly into all the other markets. Uh, so you saw that with games um, so, and and um, and game game aggregators, game platforms, uh, through to the kind of stuff we were doing, where everything as mundane and as uh, as as terrible as daily horoscopes and uh, and things like that, and yeah. daily quizzes. 
through to more sophisticated things like paying for your parking with uh, with SMS, uh, getting exam results uh, from university via SMS, alerts and all that stuff. So we basically built out a whole suite of products and just kept rolling them out. Um, and uh, and they were rolled out uh, all across the world. Um, that was the genesis, basically, of, of a business called the Hyper Factory, um, which ended up being one of the largest mobile uh, agencies uh, in the world. Um, and it shifted from being that B2B type supplier of products through to the agency model, um, which was creating campaigns and, and platforms and tools for brands. Um, and it transitioned everything through mobile. So it started with, with SMS, used voice, IVR, uh, through to the beginning of WAP uh, ages. Jeez, I can't, never said that word for so long. Um, <laughs> WAP and then, uh, you know what I mean? Is it, I do. Crazy? No, I do because, I mean, I'm, I've been involved almost as long as you just by merely mm. watching. And, you know, we did the first networking at Morgan Stanley, and then we did the first um, installation of Sun workstations at, at Morgan as well. So, I mean, the, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, WAP, yeah, I get it. Yeah. And then to the mobile web and then to through the apps came out, 3G and all that kind of stuff. So we, we built this this, uh, this company, the Hyper Factory, around the uh, the ethos that brands needed to to use this channel um, to connect themselves with consumers for an action to occur. Which at the you know, in, in those those years or that time was was a, a fairly fairly challenging proposition for a lot of brands. Um, but we found uh, a lot of traction. Uh, we found a lot of growth, had a lot of great clients that took us around the world, a lot of great partners, uh, global partners, uh, like ad agencies that were able to take us through the world. Uh, you know, we had maybe 10, 15 offices around the world, um, clients uh, that we ran programs for, like McDonald's, Coke, Nike, you know, through 20-something countries, that kind of thing, and really just kept learning. Uh, another lesson there, though, I think that uh, that we picked up was we transitioned from a product business to a service business and didn't really figure it out uh, until it was too late that the multiple and the exit potential of a product business was so much higher than a service business. And I see that a lot today as well um, with, uh, with a lot of founders at the moment that, that not quite sure of, of modeling uh, and how things work. Um, after that, uh, that business was acquired uh, by Meredith. By Meredith. Uh, yeah, so I had no idea who they were um, before we embarked on our acquisition strategy. Um, we uh, we were very excited with our acquisition, with our exit plan, um, and we had played ourselves around the world. So uh, my brothers were in New Zealand, states, and I was and we were very clear about the type of persons or the different types of groups that we were pursuing courting to have them acquire us. And in the one box um, were, were publishers, basically, media houses that it need, that would need to shift um, as this world was eating them alive. But in that box are all the usual suspects that you'd put in there, you know, Condé Nast, uh, through to AOL and that kind of thing. We'd never heard of Meredith. Um, and when we did and started to find out about them, we realized that um, – they were. They had a lot of similarities in terms of how they, they had built their business. It was a family company. I think it was fifth generation. They were 100 and something years old. Mm. They're huge, um, you know, uh, listed in the States, massive cash flow, but very forward looking. So they, they pretty much own the market in the States for, for, for the Asian audience listening and only the, the, the female audience. So everything you see and, and hear when a brand wants to reach or engage with, with the female target audience. Uh, these guys are the most established units. Everything from, you know, Rachel Ray on, on cooking, uh, recipes.com, uh, Better Home and Garden, Fitness, all of those publications uh, are all theirs. And they had, you know, the largest NBC um, affiliate network in the States, I think it was at the time. Yeah. So they had they had all these things. When we started talking with them, um, they impressed us because – they were already – we were the final stage of their 10-year plan. Ten years earlier, they had created, they had embarked on a plan to shift their business, and they realized to do that, they needed to make hard decisions based on uh, stop focusing on how much money we're making today because they were making a lot of money in that old world right. uh, and really focus on investment on, uh, on something that they didn't know. And they laid out a plan uh, that basically said they needed to buy the best of the best in a whole bunch of sectors or verticals, uh, basic competency in, in web, um, best of the best in analytics, best of the best in social, 
oh, best of the best in content production, et cetera, et cetera. And there was six, uh, six different boxes, and, and mobile was, was a box. And we were that acquisition. Um, so after that announced, um, one of the companies we'd spun out of there was analytics company, mobile analytics. Uh, that ended up being listed in, in, uh, in New Zealand or Australia, and, and that's still alive today, but that's a separate business. So I'm not involved with that. And what was the Hyperfactory is, is alive today with, uh, with a couple of thousand employees now in the States and still okay. doing awesome things. That's incredible. And was that part of the Meredith Interactive Marketing, I mean, integrated marketing business, or was it part of the entire Meredith Corporation? Yeah, so it was, uh, it was, it sat under, uh, what was Meredith Integrated Marketing. Um, my job as a part of Earnout, um, I was the last of the founders in Earnout, um, that, that part of the trigger. The other founders, most of them had gone already, hmm. uh, after their acquisitions had taken place, because some of the acquisitions were at least a couple of three years before us. And my, uh, my last part of Earnout, uh, was to bring all those, help bring all those entities together. Um, all those disparate units, bring them all together, create a new brand, uh, create new processes, new processes for new business, new positioning, all that kind of thing, and uh, and really integrate it together. Um, and that was, you know, a lot of founders I think wouldn't have stayed on for that challenge. Mm. Uh, a lot of my friends suggest that you know, their advice was to, to go when you could, um, you know, leave while you can. You know? right. um, and I think I saw it as a, as not like a challenge, as in a, like you know climbing Mount Everest. I want to accomplish not so much there. But more in the, I will never get an opportunity to do this again. again. The, the thing you can do learn this, by doing yeah. that is insanely yeah. amazing, right? That was that was it. Yeah, for me, that was the biggest uh, thing. I was under no illusions as well that it would be extremely difficult and different. Now, sure. you, because now you're basically doing a corporate job, right? Yep. You're you're in an environment that you're completely not used to. Um, it's not as simple as how we, you know, how, when I say how the collective we, how we do things, which is like we're quick. Um, now there is a board. Now there are you know an independent board. Um, there are public shareholders. There are analysts. So these things matter, um, and it was it was a lot of learnings. Uh, and and I'm really grateful for those learnings, and I'm grateful for the opportunity that uh, the CEO at the time, Steve Lacey, uh, and my uh, my own boss, the head of uh, of MX and David Brown, the opportunity they gave me to be you know to be a part of that uh, of leading that change. How long did you do that? Uh, so earnout was two years, and then I stayed on a, another year, and so I spent about a, a year and a half. Uh, leading this process or, or driving this process, and bringing you, everything together. Were you satisfied when you were done? I mean, I guess you're you're the kind of person if you're like I'm, you're kind of never th- satisfied. But were you happy with the result that that happened? Um, yeah, I, in in so much that uh, when I walked away, um, almost all of the team uh, that my brothers and I had built were still there. That's amazing. Um, even up until last year. Last year, which is two thousand, you know, that's five years or more right. after the acquisition. Most of the senior leadership um, and uh, you know, and department heads and, and you know the management function um, of the team that we had created and, and, and built um, are, are were still there, um, and that that to me was amazing. Being able to to look, you know, check on LinkedIn every now and then and see people's <laughs> profiles. Right. You know, it's it's great. You it know? Is, and the other it side is super of it right. Is, the ones that have left as well, that's also, you know, it really, it's impressive, you know, when you, when you look back on, on the impact, not, not that you have, you know, self-important or anything, it's not that, it's, it's that you've done something good, right? right yeah. um, when I look back on the people that have moved on and where they are in their careers, um, you know, they're all doing amazing things now. And, and I would, I would like to think that it was, that we played a role in that, right? That business and the opportunities that were given to them. And the ability for them to step up, make mistakes, fail, screw up, get Learn, it better, get yeah. it right. Yeah. And, and I'd like to think that the, that helps them get where a lot of these guys are today. Um, and, yeah, so it makes me, makes me happy, I think. Yeah, I mean, it should. You know, earning a ton of money, I think, and money itself is a commodity. But actually doing something substantive and watching that thing stay and thrive is really the payoff, I think, for most people that want to build things. And to the extent that you actually – have real humans benefiting from the effort that really started with, you know, an idea with three brothers in New Zealand is nothing short of amazing, I think. No? Oh, I mean, I really, but yeah. it is, and it is what it is, right? So there's, in my mind, I listen to so much stuff, you know, where people, 
give this standard speech of, you know, I'm honored and humbled to do something that has no honor and no humility in it. And yet, <laughs> and yet, yeah. and yet um, here's somebody who's actually built something really huge, was kept on actually to do the integration. Theoretically, right, if you were, and you weren't, but if you had been sort of bad at that skill set. It would have been, you would have left. Well, you would have left I mean, and you would have been, been moved out. You, you know? yeah? Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. but beyond that. You would have been put fact, in a role that yeah. gave you a title that basically said you can sit in the room all day and, uh, and go out and go to conferences. Right, but think and about there it. was no way I wanted to do that. No, no, right? no, no. no. And, <laughs> and, and if you think about like the different skill set that it takes to literally take an idea, I always talk about like taking nothing and making it into something. That's really difficult. And it's not a skill that yep. everybody has, but also the further on skill of taking something that's really good and making it even bigger is also really hard. They're two separate skill yep. sets. Um, but yep. what you're saying is that you actually had an overlap, which to me is really interesting because it's rare, I think, where someone can take a company and we see it in, we see it in public today, right? So you have a company like Google, you know, founded a long time ago, but they brought in <clears throat> Eric Schmidt and they said, look, we need some adult supervision here. They brought in Eric Schmidt and said, you're the CEO for the next five years while we figure out what it means to be a CEO, then we'll make you the chairman. So even those guys who are, you know, at any level, ridiculously brilliant said, we don't mm -hmm. know how to do that. So yep. again, they learned that skill set along the way. And, you know, again, just the fact that they kept you along for that integration says something about their confidence in your ability to yeah, I mean, grow and learn or, that, or yeah? it, it, it probably says a, l a lot about my, 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 my desire to learn was, was greater than my, uh, my ability to, <laughs> you know, to screw up, I guess. Maybe. But, um, either you know, way, was, either way was, though, right? Yeah. But they, they, yeah, it was a supportive environment and it was, there was a hunger for me because I knew there was no op other opportunity. Could they have, you know, if, if they had hired someone like the examples you've given, if they had, if they had gone out to get that professional person to do that, would they have got better results? If I'm, you know, in heart of hearts, probably, and they it's a, probably, it's you know, maybe, they found though. some of the best that what they do. But it's a, it's a maybe. But I'm still going to err on the side of probably. But um, you know, they they gave me the opportunity, and and I took it, and I was able to learn from it, and and I'm, you know, I, and contribute and do what I was supposed to do at the same time. I think a large part of that was there was a guy there called Briggs uh, Ferguson, and he was previously IAC, uh, you know, um, and helped build out all the dating sites, and uh, you know, and he had he had very similar experiences. You know, he had, he had been a part of that leadership. Uh, he was very, still very young, very innovative. Um, a West Coast guy, which is, which is, again, very different for us because uh, mm. the whole time in the States, we were very on the East Coast, which is much closer to, to how we operate in this part of the world as well. Sure. Um, but I got on with him tremendously. And, you know, he, he gave me a lot of latitude. Uh, gave me a lot of latitude and a lot of support. So, yeah, it, was, uh, it, was, it allowed me to see the other side. And that ha comes in very handy now. Mm. Uh, the last few years, being able to, help, um, you know, the portfolio companies and, and the teams that I mentor and, and work with, being able to, able to help them to understand that there is all, you know, there's, there's, I call it the two hats kind of, kind of theory, right? There's the hat you wear and the hat you see or the lens you have, but for every one lens, there must always be the other lens. It's like double accounting. And a lot of these guys, especially ad tech plays that, uh, that I help and work with and have in the portfolio, the ad tech plays, a lot of them, they, they just see the one side, you know? Uh, things like, well, this, this this will make it better for the consumer, or this is this is how it should be, or this technology is better, but they don't see the other side, which is, you know, unfortunately for them, the, the, for our tech places, where the money comes from is not the consumer; it comes from from the corporate side. Right. Being able to understand how inside that engine works, how what matters to those people, uh, and plus on the acquisition side, you know, um, being able to understand how corporates do acquisitions, which is quite surprisingly is. Very rarely uh, come up, you know. It's it's not it's not at the top of conversation when, when people talk when founders talk about exits. They talk right. about acquisitions. Right, but they don't but understand how trade sales down, work. They don't, yes. Yeah, don't they know. don't. Yeah, exactly. When don't you know. dumb it down to trade sales, those like it's it sounds so pedestrian, right? Trade sales, but it's like, not. Oh, though, like, it's like, so but hard. It's not, and it's the biggest engine, right, in an economy. It's sure. those businesses. Yep. And you know we're we're so enamored by unicorns and who cares? And, Sorry. Uh, you know, Listen. And, bazillion dollar crap, you know, all these kind of giant things. The reality is, you know, I, and this is not aim low. No, no, this no. It's not that. This is a reality state. It's the fact that the, the, the environment, the, the corporate environment or the, the economic environment in, in, in any market or any nation thrives on that middle sector, right? Like for every one of those little pointy ones at the top, there are basically, you know, 100,000 of these ones in the middle Correct. that are zero to 100 million in revenue that Correct. just... You know, they, 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 they breathe bullets. They, right? drive, they the drive the whole country. They drive the economy. Yeah. 
Yeah, and so, that's where the acquisitions take place. So, that's where the money changes hands. So this you know? is this is what's really interesting to me, and I was I wanted to go here, but you've actually segued really nicely into this. Okay, and I want to back up because you said something earlier. Mm. It's kind of like a throwaway line, maybe because you were just went through it and. It seems so obvious to you at the time. But so you're running the hyperfactory. You're operating and you said 12 countries, 20 countries. I can't remember the number, but a yeah, lot of countries. Yeah, like that. It's like 15, lots, yeah. Lots, right? So you're sitting there and business is going, well, you're dealing with Coca-Cola. You're dealing with McDonald's. It's not like you're dealing with third-rate clients either. But you did sit around and talk with your partners and say, we need to be acquired. Yeah, right. So you were, you were probably not doing a billion dollars a year in revenue, but you were in the spot that you just mentioned. Right. Absolutely. So, so how did you decide? I really want to understand the the impetus. That was the word I was thinking. Is what's the impetus sure. behind you getting together and saying, "Okay, we're on fire. Everything's going really well." But why yep. do we want to be acquired? Because I get the sense it wasn't for the cash out. I want to yep. understand why. Yeah. So I guess as a preface, um, I have become a lot a lot wiser and a lot more uh, sure, deliberate sure, sure. as 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 I got older. Um, we all have a lot of that credit. I know where it comes from. A lot of that credit is actually due to my middle brother, Derek. Um, he was always a lot more deliberate uh, and a lot more uh, about not tomorrow, but next year and the year and the year after. Whereas for me, I was, you know, the, 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 the tactician uh, a lot of the times. I could, you know, I, I would dream big, but my tactician. My tactics were, were where I was strong. And so when you put, you know, when you couple us together and, and, and the rest of the team, we, you know, we all fit the pieces. But I, I had to learn that process from him of being deliberate and being conscious about, about the, the actual path, not just the direction. And, you know, again, another thing that I think a lot of, a lot of founders and a lot of commentators these days, they, they throw around words like strategy. Right. Uh, and they throw around things like, you know, true north and da da da. And yeah, they're all important, absolutely. The definition of these things and getting clarity on what you actually mean is, is key. Most crews that I spend time with, they do not have a strategy. Um, you know, it, it's once in a, once in a blue moon where I'm actually fully impressed with, with, with strategic chops from someone. They have a vision. Right. I was going to say they have a, a plan. Direction. They have a plan. Yeah, they don't they have, have a strategy. A, absolutely. It's very different. But there is no, and they have a whole pile of tactics. Yeah. But they have no strategy. No strategy. Right? And yeah. so we, we had gone through multiple rounds of fundraising. Um, I think the last round we had raised maybe 15 mil um, to do the expansion through the states. And as a part of that, at the beginning of that fundraising round, it was not what's the strategy to raise these funds. It's what's the strategy. And then the fundraising, that round was a tactic to get to achieve our strategy. Interesting. Got it. That was a very different way of looking at things, right? Sure. Most people was like strategy is to raise money. and da, da, da. So when we sat down, it was like, okay, well, where, what are we raising this money for? If we raise this money and we keep growing like we're growing, what's the purpose? And that was also the time when we realized really when it hit us that this business, uh, which is essentially a service business, professional services yeah. with a technology layer, uh, will never have a multiple of 24, 26, 50, whatever, right, right? On, on anything, on earnings, on future, on EBIT, nothing. Yeah. And so that was just a fact that we had to accept. Um, and when you hit that realization, you kind of go, okay, well, you've got all these people, you're, you're doing real things, you're, you know, real money changing, and you're helping real brands, you're employing real people, you're part of an ecosystem in, in different countries, but now what are you going to do? Right. And I think, you know, where, where when we make choices, we make a choice, A, because it's not because A is a good choice, but A is a better choice than B. And for us, well, we needed to know how we we're going to get out, because we couldn't do this forever because it was never going to be this thing that needed it needed to be you know for, from a financial perspective to allow us to do what we wanted to do next etc and so we said okay well this has to be an acquisition we can't uh, what, what are our options right we we can we can buy other people and do right. a roll up we can list or try to list and then you know and then have to keep growing and exit through the the, the the freeing up of liquidity on the public market, right? Yep. You can shut it down and do something else from an opportunity cost perspective, or you can be acquired. And we went through each one of those options, essentially, from the start uh, at that point. And we looked at every single thing. And again, you know, as, as a crew, we had incredible support from advisors, from existing shareholders, and the new money coming in. Um, and we sat down and we said it was pretty logical, which was the clearest path for us to be able to get to go along, get out, and make sure that 
everyone that was in the business that was working there was was looked after. Right. Uh, still had a job, had you know got some liquidity out of it. The the crew, you know, the founding team and my brothers and the shareholders and everyone that were back from the beginning were able to, to to free up their money and move on to something else. And so that was the plan. Then it was a matter of being again very deliberate about well, who's going to acquire us then? Like what type of you know, and I say this when I spend time with, with the crews as well. It's like, describe to me what this thing looks like, right? right Almost right. like you know, when you do those user journeys and, you know, what is your target audience? It's the same thing. It's like, what is the profile of this thing? Like, who is this mysterious acquisition, by, you know, exit by acquisition? Who, who is this mystery box? And we, you know, broke them out into a number of boxes. So, so will it be a holding, you know, ad agency, global ad agency holding companies? Will it be a media company? Um, will it be, you know, a, a large um, new media company or, or some kind of play? And we looked at what the competition was doing at the time. And there was a number of acquisitions, a number of mergers happening, uh, and various people doing various things. And so we could see. Um, we based the multiples and, and the earnings and the path, uh, the path forward on, you know, on basically standard professional services and with a with a premium because of the technology and because the, you know, the, the innovation around it. Right. But we were pretty clear about who was going to pay more: an advertising agency, holding company, and we went down that route for a while and had a. I had a strong partnership a number of years earlier that, that enabled us to springboard globally with, with publicists. Right. But we knew that they would never pay more than maybe three or four times. Um, so they were at the bottom of the heap. So it's like, well, we're not going to waste our time going down there. And so, again, those things were you know, out of your comfort zone uh, because you're shutting doors. Basically, every time you made a choice, you're closing a door. But we closed doors until we had a door left and went straight down it. That's really interesting. And that's really, I think what you've, you've summed up a little bit there is that two hats view as well, right? In the sense of the hat we're wearing is what's the best thing for us? What's the yep. best thing for our Absolutely. entire crew? But the other hat is we have to look at this from the other Ooh. side, which is what's the best thing for uh, the person that's going to acquire us, right? Yeah. Who, who are we most attractive to? Right. You know? and, and how do we position ourselves? Because that's essentially what we did. After we raised that, that I think it was 15, think it was 10, 10. 10, 12, 15, something like that last round. Um, after we raised that, that, um, that round, that round was spent very, very focused on positioning ourselves as best as we could for that acquisition. Right. So not to be everything for everyone that we, you know, in this box, right? Not everything, everyone full stop, not even everything, everyone in this box. It was position ourselves for this acquisition in the eyes of those people that we've identified as the targets that will buy us. And so if you look back on those, actually those years, those years, you can see the results, um, you know, which are public and stuff, the, the public evidence of it are 100% correlated to our strategy. So I think there was like a period of four years in a row where we won more more creative awards than any other agency, including the big advertising agencies, the famous ones, right? right. More awards than any agency in the world. Uh, more awards than Razorfish, more awards than AKQA, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, we, we were focused on certain sectors. So if you look at our clients, it's not by accident that they fell into those boxes. Uh, you know, it was very clear that that was the reason why they were. You know, and, but at the time, people just, you know, people just run and win and run and win or run and fail. And I think you can do that or you can sit down and actually try and figure out. You, know, you, you never ever, ever read about it in history, you know, like a, a general or a battle being fought by accident. Right. No, 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 no. You never hear about a, about a, a nation or, or conquering armies and things just accidentally getting to where they were. I mean, it's it, even if they are good, they don't just fight by accident off, offhand. Oh, let's just have a battle over here, you know. So it should be no different. But again, yeah. and, you, and the key word there is having a strategy, mm -hmm. right? Which mm -hmm. is which you said earlier too. It's not just having a plan. You've got to have a strategy around the plan, and your plan and your strategy has to have tactics that are appropriate for that strategy. So, well said. It sounds so common sense, right? It, and it sounds almost <laughs> like telling people to suck eggs. And I feel like a dick sometimes when I, when nah, I talk about no this way. I, so look, I, I mentor people as well, and it's like sometimes the well, the most obvious thing. And I always say this: like, there's an easy way. And easy doesn't necessarily mean it's easy to do, but sometimes, yeah. sometimes there is a path that's like pretty straightforward and you're not looking at it because you're trying to do things that are way too complex. Now, that's not always the case, right? Yep. But I try to make very simple analogies for people. Like you can either take the bottle and try to open it by jamming it up against the wall or you can just take the bottle opener and open it. Exactly, right? Right. But so to do that, it's second nature for us for a bottle opener, but you, it's in your brain. The synapse is somewhere. A synapse is somewhere. sits down and says, right. You need to first find a bottle opener. Where is the bottle opener? It's exactly. in that drawer. How do I get to that drawer? Right? Which steps do I take to get to the kitchen quickest? Exactly. How do I get to that drawer? I take the bottle opener out. Do I shut the drawer after I take the bottle opener out now, or do I leave it open? Do I and to put the bottle opener back in the drawer? And that's your strategy, yep. right? Like your strat, and then you know your tactics inside there. But you must have that 
thing. Um, and you know, to your point about the, the difference between a plan and you know and a vision and, and a strategy, the plan is open your bottle, right? Right. That's not that that, that, that doesn't help anybody. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Any, anybody can come up with that plan. Yeah? Correct. Um, and yeah, I think you know it's uh, it's interesting. You know, these last few years have been um, have been so aggressive, uh, which is great, right? I mean, yeah. it's not like when we started our businesses, you know, in 2000, starting something when the world had melted. In 2008, we started something when the world had melted again. And so now I think, you know, these the, the crews that have started things now and started things last years, they have an environment which is buoyed by momentum. Um, and so you are able to hide and gloss over a lot of uh, a lot of failings a lot of mistakes and and even worse you're you're able to actually get away with malicious or, or you know malevolent behavior and right. still get it or get away with it without even trying to cover it up just because the macro is pushing forward but at some point the music's going to stop correct uh, i'm not saying the world's going to end i'm just no, saying no. the music's going to stop right things are still going to go keep going uh, but the music will slow down and it will stop and when that happens you best be sure that you know you have a very clear plan uh, on what to do and how to do it because just simply saying, yeah, I'm going to open the bottle, ain't going to cut it, no. and you're going to be dead, right? Yeah. So let's take all the things that you've learned, and I was going to say culminate, but I don't really think there's ever a culmination, not for people that are constantly thinking, internalizing, and learning, right? But now yeah. that you're – what's the name of your fund that you're working on now? Uh, Hatel Capital. So. Right. So Hato Capital, right? You said you uh, six months ago, nine months ago, you wrote a thesis that you published. Yes, well, I, I really want to know what the thesis year. is. Um, basically, the the thesis was written last year, and it's around um, the the notion um, that China matters. Uh, and and I used it deliberately those those words because there's you know there, it, it's common sense. There's a play, but there's also a bit of um, right. There are multiple meanings there. Uh, yeah, there's also a bit of a hey, wake up. China does matter, right? Yeah. To it, which um, a bit of frustration behind it. Why? And it, Why are you frustrated? Because it seems to me like the rest. Am I just too deep in the morass to know to not I think feel like yeah. that people don't know? I think you're too deep. Yeah, I think you know people people that are out here like us are are very often uh, too deep. It, it's so obvious to us. That's why we're out this part of the world and we see it every day. And yeah, I mean, I, I have a lot of friends uh, and 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 people that that I that I respect that that inspire me that I that I love. And I trust, um, you know, in, in the West that uh, that don't share that view. Wow. Funnily, though, they, they increasingly share it today. But, um, you know, last year, it was a big turning point, right? The November elections, new um, new leadership in the States uh, actually had a positive impact on, on, on my thesis. Um, prior to that, there was very little care uh, given by, by many people, by most people. Um, and more recently, there has been a lot more, uh, I don't know if it's care, but a lot more like, hmm, maybe we should be, maybe we should be listening, maybe we should be watching. The thesis anyway was based around the fact that, um, uh, basically a China macro thesis, um, that China's moves uh, and on a macro level, uh, what's happening domestically but impacting macro globally, affect almost every sector uh, and every type of business. Whether you are making something in China cheap, as you view it, to sell it overseas, or you're making something overseas and you want to sell it here, right? So a company trying to sell something here. Or um, in your home markets, the growth of Chinese visitors uh, and people and, and potential citizens that are just you know, exponentially increasing every year uh, are impacting your market there through to a liquidity perspective. Chinese um, firms buying and acquiring assets overseas as well as Chinese firms funding uh, growth of, of foreign businesses here uh, and local businesses here to compete overseas. So if you map it out, it's essentially everywhere. Um, every, you, you cannot now sit in a box and say, well, I, it doesn't really matter to me too much. And that's pretty much the case it's been um, and still pretty much is to most people. You know, well, we don't really have a factory. We don't make anything. So, you know, China's not that important. Right. Or the one that I hear most often uh, when I speak to to, uh, to founders and, and investors and analysts in the States is essentially China's not on the plans, not on the cards. Now, I hear that almost I, I, easily every week, multiple times. Actually, China's not in our plans, you know, because that's obviously a question I have to ask when, when I'm doing, you know, just even an initial presentation or due diligence. It's sure. like, so what are your plans for China? None. This is one of the first questions. What, am I, what are your plans for China? Well, we don't really have plans for China. We're, we're just going to focus on the States. 
I didn't ask, the question I asked was not where are you going to focus on, right? right. Because by focusing on the States, you still need to have a plan for China. Right. And that's, that's the thing. So the thesis kind of spelled that out. Um, and on the other side is, is basically the macro implications, which are the government here uh, is something that most people don't understand. Uh, the, relation, the government itself and the relationship between the government and the people. Um, and the government here is very transparent, uh, which most people go, what? Uh, I thought it was a communist dictatorship or something like that, right? So right. it is extremely transparent government. This this country lays out their plans for the world to see, for all their people to see, and says this is exactly what we're going to do. And this is not our plans for next year, next month, next four years, next election cycle, whatever the, the rest of the world does. These are our plans for the nation for the next 40, 400 years, right? right? And these are the sectors, these are the, these are the sectors of society, these are the themes, these are the, the large blocks that we, that we need to tackle and we need to be either number one, number two, or number three of. Um, and this is the, the, the cost that it's going to have to us as a society, as a country, and this is the investment that's required and, and hence the plan to get there. And so the flip side of my China Matters theory is it's identified what those are. Um, you know, I'm, I'm betting with the house, basically. Basically. Right? Uh, there are six, you know, for, for my thesis, there are six main themes, and those are the themes. So if the macro force, which is a large, single largest from a national perspective, uh, macro force globally, is Chinese government and China money. If they're betting on these six, then those six are going to happen. So that's where I funnel my six in as well. So um, what are they? And with, well, so in, in the six, uh, you can split them up, I guess, with uh, with. Uh, culture is one. Uh, inside culture fits everything from um, uh, entertainment, um, content, uh, through to national heritage, local heritage, through to artwork. So if you look around the world, you know, most of the Hollywood studios and, and, and um, those types of companies, the old uh, content owners are now under ownership by Chinese or investment by Chinese through to uh, content creation, content creation studios, virtual reality. I had a really interesting meeting yesterday. Um, with, um, uh, he's going to kill me, James, I can't remember his surname, who runs a, uh, a huge VR crew. And he was telling me about uh, one of the companies here is like the second largest, uh, was well, the second largest OEM behind Foxconn and how they know that they can't compete being an OEM uh, in the Foxconn space, which is reactive to an order that's placed by someone like an Apple. Yep. These guys are, 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 I think they're a year into their three-year investment build of the equivalent of, of you know, huge fab plants for semicons, but for VR, uh, VR hardware. So you know, this is all fitting in that culture space, and China will own it, right through to the football teams, right? So yep. Premier League soccer teams, um, you know, Chinese ownership, through to artworks. Um, you know, the most expensive artworks in the world are increasingly built by Chinese. They have a, they've been given this duty of guardianship because no one else wants the asset. That's one box. Second box is, uh, you know, around the people. So whether that's uh, health care, um, elder care, child care. Uh, are the three main boxes, at least for me. Uh, so insurance, um, elder care, and child care. Uh, you know, elder care is is uh, is a massive thing. They have the largest population in the world, full stop, one and a half billion people. So naturally, they have the largest population of old people. Correct. Um, they have this huge shift of old, you know, of people getting older, and also a retraction, which the government has again made public, that they are going to step away from providing. Not a, they will continue to provide a safety net, but they're stepping away from providing all those things that are associated under a, a communist or socialist uh, e economy or system, um, which is basically you know the bedrock of of, uh, of for old people if you're in this environment. So they've made it public; they're going to step away from this, and they have brought the part, the private world in uh, from around the globe and locally to take their place. Uh, so again, it's it's not a pivot; it's not a whole oh, shit. I need to do something for elections and and you know plug a budget deficit. It's a considered, well thought out plan that will take the next thirty years to accomplish. Right, and that means um, that there's a that means that there's a market gap huge that another needs to get filled. Huge right? opportunity, right? right? Huge opportunity, huge market cap, and a huge amount of money behind it. Um, and so we see, you know, in the portfolio, I have uh, uh, we have some you know, amazing crews in 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 those spaces. But again, those those spaces they have not only just the thing itself, but then the supporting ecosystem around it, um, which you know, which is which is where there's growth there. Uh, consumer um, aspect of things, they call this um, the consumption, uh, the drive to consumption, the Chinese uh, Chinese government's plan. So drive to consumption basically is, uh, you know, in local parlance, is lifting of the middle class. 
Yeah, we, we have to move as a, as, a, as a country here. We have to move, I think, it's 300 and something million um, people from rural and, OE, uh, and, and UN rankings of poverty, WHO rock poverty rankings. We have to move 350, 360 million people out of poverty into the middle class, I think, in the next 12 years. There's close to 40, 30 something million people a year are going to be moved in. Oh, it's, it's, oh, the, oh. it's the entire country of the United States of America needs to get moved yeah. from poverty into the middle class. That's a big job, right? Exactly. I, it's a huge job, right? And it's not a job, you know, and when, you, when I say things like that, people are like, oh, it will never happen. It and will. I, I purposely <laughs> don't, yeah, I purposely don't preface it no. with, the fact, with the fact that it's like, well, in the last 10 years, they've already moved 400, right? right? So, so it's, the track record's there. Um, and, you know, again, it's like, do you really want to bet against the house? Do you really want to? It doesn't make any sense. So that whole drive to consumption or consumption upgrade, um, you know, you, you're now talking about play, ad tech plays, uh, e-commerce, back end, um, analytics for optimization of ad spend, which is the largest component of money that drives consumer spend, uh, which is what the consumption strategy is about. You know, so rather than focusing on, you know, oh, I'm going to sell things to somebody, which, you know, there are winners in that space, but it's, it's a lot harder to fight than, mm. than the space behind where there's a bigger pile of money behind it as well, um, which is that how do I make that money spent better um, through to the changing tastes of that new consumer that shifts into there. Uh, that's also the box. Um, you know, people think fintech and Alipay and WeChat. It's, it's a fintech box, but, you know, it's not a fintech thing. It's, it's driven because of this drive to consumption. Right. I actually just read an article this morning. Oh, that's right. There was a crew out of Singapore, I think, that just got funding from Sequoia, China for 16 mil. They're AI Annie, that's right, for, uh, for banks, uh, which is my the third sector, which is infrastructure. So like this, this crew is an example. I, I just saw the piece on the, on LinkedIn today, the announcement. They got 16 million in a, in a, in Series A funding from Sequoia, China, a company called AI Annie, and uh, oh Hyper Annie, that's right, Hyper Annie, and um, they are basically a corporate. Uh, they're an AI AI. They're an AI tool for banks to make better decisions not from a consumer perspective, but an internal perspective, mm. because the banking sector is undergoing such massive reform here right now, right? Led and driven by the consumer side, Alipay, uh, WeChat Wallet, et cetera, et cetera, and, you know, which is the largest, most valuable fintech play in the world is Ant Financial. Right. But the, the government has made it very clear that how that whole infrastructure side of things needs to be reformed, re-regulated, um, and made to support this new world. And that's an a fundamental difference between here and the West. The West, what happens is we do smart things and then we're forced to fit inside regulation or we're forced to battle giant forces of regulation until we're big enough, like a Google, to have regulation change. Whereas here, um, they are reforming the regulation to fit with the way the world should be or the, what, the way that they want the world should be. So again, it's you know same question. Do you want to bet against the house, or would you just look where the house is betting? Where's the deal of dealing the cards to, and that sector there? And you know some of these things um, in my thesis as well. There's an equal balance between what can the world learn from here, and what can here learn from the world. Right. So as an example, in insurance, um, you know the rest of the world, the states, um, well, London, I guess where it started with Lloyd's and Bearings. You know we have three, four hundred years of insurance. As, as a science, right? As a science and maybe a hundred years or 80 years as a consumer, uh, as a consumer product. Right. Uh, whereas China, it's, it's only just arrived, um, you know, because prior to that, there was no such thing as insurance. Why would I need insurance as a communist or socialist economy, right? right. Everything is insured right. by, by, by the people. By definition, um, right? By definition, right? So, but again, the government, uh, ever transparent, made it very clear where this is supposed to go, what roles they expect who to play. Uh, in, in this shift to insurance uh, or public private market um, providers and, uh, you know, and has laid out a plan, a very clear plan. And so that's an, a sector which is going undergoing basically what is, I view it as having electricity for the first time. Right. Literally, it's like them switching on a switch and going, oh, my God, I can do all these things with this electric, you know, this, this current. And that's what's happening in insurance. One of the uh, really smart crews that I work with, um, a company called the Care Voice, um, who 
who uh, you know, are, are a, a B2B uh, insurance play. Um, and as that, that's one of the growth areas in, in the space is providing insurance, workplace insurance for employees. Again, something that's never happened before. Right. And increasingly, you know, more and more employees as this middle class grows, as they move to the cities, as they get white collar jobs, they're all going to be provided with the insurance and medical and stuff that we're, we're just accustomed to in the rest of the world. And there aren't these platforms, there aren't these providers that, that provide the tools for the employees to, to engage, to, to file, to, to, to reconcile, to optimize, to, to have their spend, their, you know, their monthly paycheck deduction done better or optimized out of it. And also on the flip side, you know, to, to give better value to the employees and employees. And so these guys, like the scale that they're going through, um, you know, they're, they're doing around at the moment. They're adding something ridiculous, you know, through one of their clients is AXA. I think it's, you know, it's, it's a few thousand new employees, paid, in, you know, paid, paid subscribers, paid customers, a few thousand a week, just bang, bang, bang. The growth is, is nuts. Um, you know, the, the amount of policy activity that's happening and what they're doing um, is, is insane. And, you know, you just even look at the largest insurer here, Peng An. I was right. at, a, at a conference one, and the CMO of Peng An was, uh, was on the panel. And we're just talking with each other. And, you know, I remember he said, my, my force, my sales force, you know, is, is a million strong. A million agents. That's bigger than most country standing armies. Right? That's his own, basically, private army. Basically. A million strong. I mean, that's just unheard of. So the scale of this change is so fast. Um, but yeah, I mean, we can go through the other sectors. There's you know, time, but but it's that kind of that kind of uh, the tone basically is there. Is is I've laid it out, um, tried to clarify it for myself, and and being able to kind of see where this fits. The other side to it, I think, is geographically. So the portfolio focuses on obviously inside China, but it also focuses on the states uh, and. Um, and Australia is another part of it as well. Australia and New Zealand, right? Uh, and and to a to a growing extent, um, but but will not. You know, it's not going to be a huge shift. But Southeast Asia, um, you know. But these these are clear uh, in line with this China macro. Um, what's what's happening uh, globally? The technology that's being that's being developed here, that's being adapted here, uh, and that's being used here and increasingly global globally will change the way things are done and. You know, it's it's imperative, I think, that uh, that people in other markets just at least understand what's happening, uh, understand the things that are going on. So I try to, whenever possible, when I write or um, when people are kind enough to give me an opportunity like this, I try to, wherever possible, uh, explain some of the things that's happening on the ground, uh, the significance of it, uh, and and to really kind of try to open eyes because I think there still is a lot of reluctance. Um, you know, conscious or unconscious bias, um, and and I don't, you know, we want a net positive world, right? So Correct. I don't don't want to get to a point where there's an us and them uh, situation, you know, which we increasingly face, um, you know, on a global level, and you know, they're, they're, the world is changing, um, you know, at this level, and and there's this change is significant, but I think half of the people that are going to be affected by the change are not even aware of the change, and that's. You know that that's that's the space that we're sitting in right now. Wasn't well, that the biggest part of this whole thesis of China Matters? Is and I think it embodies itself in that conversation you you referenced earlier, where you walk into somebody's office and say, "What is your strategy for China?" And they say, "We don't have a strategy for China. We're focusing on the United States." And you you literally have to sit down, take a deep breath, and essentially yeah. educate them from the get go. And I th- I think you made a really good point. I mean, you made a few a bunch of good points, but one of them is that. You know, we're so deep in the middle of this vortex that it's hard for us to understand. And I think it's important for us as well to understand that not everybody perceives these things in the same way that we do. I mean, if you just think about the fact that just insurance, which in and of itself is a gigantic global market, right? But we've had the actual actuarial math and, like you said, the science yeah. of insurance for 400 years. <laughs> yeah, centuries, basically. Right. And that means that companies like Aetna or Hartford Insurance or any of these companies in the United States, but also, as you mentioned, the companies in England, um, which is where all of this stuff or a lot of this stuff was originally developed, right, um, have been doing that forever. But in a country where the government provided um, de facto insurance for everybody, which meant that it wasn't mm-hmm. something you had to purchase for yourself. And now mm-hmm. that the leadership, you said, with full transparency, has said that was good for, for, for them. But what we're finding is that as our economy matures and becomes more complex, 
there are better private, potentially better private solutions yep. to, and better mathematics and better science around it as well. So let's yes. employ some of those. But in my mind, and this is where I think the key, this is another key that people don't understand about China. I'm going to exaggerate a little bit, but I think it makes the point, and that is there's basically a greenfield market for every large vertical in the sense that we used to talk about this when we developed technology at Goldman Sachs or at Deutsche Bank, is that there's no legacy system. Right? You're not replacing yep. a mainframe yep. with Objective-C or with you know, C-sharp, with .NET. Yeah, exactly. Basically, you, you, there, there is no yep. mainframe. Yeah. And, and to yep. be fair, there's no C-sharp. What we're doing is we're looking at the world and saying, huh. That, that what your last few words there are the most important, right? Yeah, We're so. looking at the world. That is exactly what happens here, right? right? It's basically, we're going to look to see what is the best possible route to get to where we want to go. And in doing so, we're clear on the route. And then we're able to say, well, what do we have here? What, we, what can we do here? What can we buy there? What can we learn from there? Or what can we bring together, right? right. Now, when you speak to most people um, about uh, this kind of topic, it leads itself naturally to this whole question of IP. And people uh, talk about, you know, oh, China, they just copy things. Uh, they, they just make cheap copies and they steal, you know, they, they steal stuff all the time and blah, 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 blah. And yes, that was true, right? right. That, that, that was, but can you, can you, can you, can you not understand why? Like, would you, would I expect anything else? If the whole world has told me to make stuff here and the whole world uses me to make stuff for them, every single product in the world essentially has been shunted to me to make, right. you would, you call me a thief now, but you would call me stupid if it was the other way around and you had built all this stuff for other people, for a pittance, right? For a pittance. Right. That's why you shifted your crap to be built here. Right. You because it cost you nothing. Right. It wasn't like, you weren't doing it out heart. of benevolence. No, there's yeah. no benevolence right? there. So you call me a thief now, but if I didn't do that, you'd probably be laughing at me now and calling me stupid, going, oh, well, you had 20 years to figure out how to, how to make a football, right. and, you didn't. and you didn't. Oh, you're an idiot, right? Yep. But the fact is that was then. That was yesterday, yeah. right? China no like un, be under no illusions. No, none. China no longer wants to make everything for the world. Those plastic chairs or the barbecue set or whatever you know, the, the cheap socks or even the more expensive you know Ivanka Trump dress or whatever it is that is currently made here. The crap you buy in Walmart or whatever, right? China does not want to make that anymore, right? Like it's not. It's not by choice. It was part of the plan. It was a necessary phase to go through. And when they had, when they developed that plan back in, you know, when Deng Xiaoping sat down and, and, and started opening up the country, the plan didn't stop with open up the country. Let's get people to build factories here no. and I'll pocket some money as the local mayor. Right. I mean, the strength of this, of the leadership here is, is, is second to none in that respect, the ability to see ahead and, and understand what's involved. And the responsibility to, to the country or to the nation or to the people trumps any, any version of rights for me as an individual. And, and that, that's sure. different. I mean, if, right? if, you were, if you were going to start a country from scratch mm. and I allotted you 100 million people or a billion people, it doesn't, I'm indifferent. But if, you, if mm. I were going to allow you to build a country from scratch and you just had to take 100 million people and take them from whatever state in which they currently existed to a modern state, whatever that means. And when I say state, I don't mean the government. I just mean their sure. status, yeah? yeah? Yep. You would do exactly the same thing. So th I think about it this 100%. way. Uh, I think about it this way. And again, very simplistic analogy. If I said to somebody, um, look at Jeffrey. You know, I remember when Jeffrey was a year old and he was the dude could only eat soft food. And now he has the nerve to be so, drinking yeah, exactly. good wine and eating great steak. What happened to that kid who only ate soft food? And, and again, you would say the same thing. If all you were doing was be eating ground up beets, people would say the Call dude's, a, idiot, the dude's right? a little bit of an idiot. Dude. Yeah. So yeah. the fact that you've it's, now it's, got uh, it's interesting, right? stolen the food, like it doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. And again, yeah. who's the idiot? But, yeah. but regardless, this, so you also said something else earlier that I want to point out to people. And that is, if you don't have, see the reasons why in an existing state with legacy systems, it's difficult to change the regulation. It's not because it's 
and this is only one reason, right? Not the only reason, but it's not because it's not clear to the regulators that changing the regulations is probably in a vacuum the right thing to do. It's that they can't do it because there are too many other vested and embedded interests that Way benefit from those regulations. Whereas in China, again, the government just goes, hmm, okay, ride hailing, not a problem. We're not putting any taxi drivers out of work. We're actually employing another 3 million people. Exactly. So we, let's yeah. have a regulation around that. Mobile payments, not a problem either, but how do we make sure that there's no fraud? And then they build regulations around that. Yep. And even with insurance and tech, you know, they don't have to protect Hartford, Connecticut. Yeah, that, that's the thing. There are, there are very definitely, there is a vested interest. The difference in vested interest is the vested interest in the countries that we look towards as inspiration and, and, you know, and big thinkers, the vested interests there are so small, so small. Yeah. Tiny. You know, whenever you read about people that, uh, that, you know, that do get pulled up by ethics committees or do, you know, get sent to jail for, for that kind of stuff, um, the amount of money that's involved is tiny, right? It's, right. it's almost selfish. It is. You know, you're talking about you know a few hundred thousand bucks, a few million bucks. Like it's it's puny sums in the schemes of things that that personal group of people did those things for self benefit for such a small amount. Because that amount, you know, even if it came to them and they spent it on other people, the the actual economic impact of that amount, um, you know, across the board is minimal. It's the minimum. Whereas yeah. here, there is a vested interest, but the vested interest is every collective. It's everybody. Right? It's the collective. Yeah. yeah. It's the absolute collective, which is the vested interest. And so when you're talking about those kind of things, the, the view, you know, that's not to say I can, I can hear read, uh, listeners right now going, oh, no, it's so corrupt. Yes, of course, there's corruption. There's all sorts of things. There's corruption like that, everywhere, though. So that's, in, a, that's a red herring. Everywhere. That's just a truism. It's yeah, a red herring as far as I'm concerned. You know, yeah. Sorry. Exactly. So, you know, zero those things out. Then yeah. you look at it and you go, shit. They, when they put their mind to, the, to, to do something here as a government, it's not being done for someone's re-election campaign. Don't care. It's not being done to support uh, one group of people, right? Oh, this, this group here because I need their vote, right? Or because we carry the majority only with these people. When they decide to do these big things, these big, scary, you know, hugely audacious things, which people go, bah, never going to happen. Those things, the decision around them, is an absolute authentic decision. Correct. A decision for for us, for the for the betterment of us. Like where do we need to go? And when you are able to do that, you're also able to reconcile on an individual level um, my role in it, right? My role, my responsibility, and my sacrifice. Right. So when I when I came out here, uh, when we came out here in, in 2006, when the first time we lived in this in what is now the, the, the main center of the city, Jing'an. At the time when I was there at the corner, I lived in an apartment building and it was a one lane road and there was this little walled village that was, you know, maybe a couple of hundred years old uh, village with, you know, with wall around it and, and this little community inside, you know, little planks of wood over running small streams and water and stuff. And one day um, they were all slapped with signs, notice signs on their doors and Slowly by slowly, the village was being dismantled, right? Just another part of progress, but it was being dismantled um, to make way for what is now, um, and it's right in the heart of where um, uh, China Accelerator, which is the, the incubator that I'm in EIR, at, right there. It's right around there in the heart of Jing'an, so all the big hotels, all the big shopping centers. And I went down to this village, uh, to this old village where I used to buy my, my, uh, my fruits and my fish and my vegetables, and I was just talking to these people to find out how they felt, um, you know, that they, they were, they were going to have to move. And of course, everyone's pissed off. Of course, everyone's angry. Of course, everyone's upset. The difference, though, uh, between there and, for example, my time living in New Zealand or in the States um, is in those other economies or those other countries that people would say, well, ha hang on a second. What about my rights? Right. Yeah. You have no right to move me out of my house. There is a process, and I'm going to fight it. I'm going to take you to court, and I'm going to, I'm going to go to the town hall when you're, when you're speaking. I'm going to throw eggs at you, and I'm going to shout at you, and you know, I'm going to dox you, um, you know, and I'm going to stalk, and all these kind of things, because I have rights. You can't just do that to me. You know, I was born here. My, parent, my mother and father were born here. My grandmother lives in the same house. She, you know, she grew up here. My whole community is here. My school is here, da, da, all these things. All those things are true. They're absolutely true. I was born here, da, 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 right? The difference here is... The people that I went to talk to replicated you know, a million times over all across China. 
those people in that village down there, those people in that village down there, they, they basically knew that in addition to their anger, they knew what their responsibility was. Right. Their responsibility was that this country had to move forward. They were not going to hold hostage development and progress of betterment of everyone, right? They need that to happen so that their kids and the next generation have a better life than they do. So, yes, of course, they're going to get some kind of compensation. Is, will it ever be enough? No. Uh, will they move to a house that you know, has a different view? Yes. Will they have to walk an extra you know, 10 minutes to go to school or whatever? Yes, yes, yes. All these negative implications will be there. But none of those were, the, were great enough of a force for them to say, hang on, I have rights. Right? And that is a fundamental, I think, a fundamental difference between between the, the progress here um, and, and, and also how startups and how crews are and companies scale so fast here, that difference of understanding between rights and responsibilities. It's, it's, a, it's a bit of a difficult one for many people to get their heads around. Um, I, I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a lecturer at, uh, at Vlerik Business School in, in, um, in Belgium. I saw that. Their, their MBA class, uh, you know, these are executive MBA guys. But, um, you know, from companies like Siemens and Bosch and, and that kind of thing. And, and they come out to China twice a year. And, and that's, that's often a discussion, a, a quite a heated discussion around rights. And, um, and I, you know, it, it, I take pains to, to try and explain this notion that it's responsibilities before rights here. Um, whereas in the, in the West, it's, it's rights before responsibilities. Yeah, I mean, I want to... Understanding that will, I think, impact how you view what, opportunity China is for you, no matter where your business is and what it does, or what the threat is that it imposes that you then can adapt to or, or take into account and change. Yeah, I want to tell a quick story and then I want to end here, not because I think that this is a natural ending for this conversation at any level. <laughs> no, I'm very serious about that. And I, and I will on air say I would like to invite you back because what I'd like to do, frankly, is go over those six parts of your thesis because I don't feel yeah, like we've, I don't, I don't feel like we've attacked that enough because, and I'm really curious, frankly, I don't care if it's online or offline, but I want to do it sure. online because I think it's interesting, not just for me, but for everybody. But I want to tell a quick story that changed my perception of China and tell you when it happened, but then also comment on your, your, um, the dichotomy, right? Between the dilemma between what are my rights and what are my responsibilities? Cause I think it's really important. So just bear with me for a second. In 1991, I went on my first trip to China three weeks. Okay. We went from Shanghai all the way to Tibet and then all the way back to Beijing. And it was a pretty insane trip, but I went there with a, with a few of my friends and all of us were between 24 and basically 26 years old. So ostensibly children. And one of us had studied, and we were coming from Tokyo, right? So one of us had studied, it was not me, um, in both Taiwan and in mainland China and was a fluent Mandarin speaker, so which back in 1991 was rare and was even more rare for someone who was from Texas. So we went around the entire country and, you know, we had our own views, which were, of course, biased by what we'd heard as we were growing up about, you know, communist governments or totalitarian governments or just, you know, one party governments that didn't have elections, like the nerve of them to just take power, right? This is what we're taught. And yet, as we were traveling through China, whether it was, you know, on, a, on an overnight train or on a bus or in a car somewhere, you know, Jim Baker, who was the guy who had studied in China, pointed out to us as the three of us, you know, sort of idiots were just going like, oh, I can't believe they have no elections in this country. He said, wait a second, I want you to look, at a, look around, not just at how many people there are here, but the expanse just get a real sense for how physically large, geographically large China is, and then tell me the best way to electrify the entire country, because that's the beginning yes. of their elect oh, because that's the beginning of their economic development. You cannot decide later that everybody needs electricity, and to do that, somebody needs to plan it from the get-go and needs to run that plan until it's over. And the only way to do that is to get everybody on board and control it from the center. And you sit there as a kid and just go, you know, you put your finger in the air and get ready to argue about how that is wrong. And you think if you're, if you have any intellectual capability at all, you say, yeah, actually the only way to do that is for someone with this expanse and this number of people and, and this, you know, all these different, not just geographical areas, but all these different racial areas as well. We're electrifying the country. Just get out of our way and we're going to do it. Because then it, that gets back now to your rights and responsibilities. And that is, yeah, I have a right to live here, 
but I have a responsibility as an individual to allow my government to electrify the entire country. And electricity is something that everybody can understand, right? Because it's going to make it better for us tomorrow. For everybody, right? like, and no one can argue about thing. it. Electric, you're, you're, what you're not saying is, I'm going to take away your chicken and give you a turkey. You're not making a value judgment. Yeah. You're basically saying, yeah. I'm going to take away nothing. I'm going to take away really nothing and give you something, and that something's going to benefit everybody. And I think in that context, when you make that statement about, hey, what are my rights? The government just says, that's fine, and you do have rights, and that's fine. But what you really have is a responsibility, not just to you, to your family, to your village, and to your region, but to your countrymen, to let us electrify the country. And it, and it manifests itself in Great roads analogy. and trains. Right analogy. Right. So I saw that, and so now, again, I take it for granted to a certain extent that, like, I had that when I was young, but you're right. And yeah. this, is why, I want to, this yeah. is why I want to go through this again. And I want to go through it on the record because I think it's really important. It'll be, fun. It'll be good. I, I, I'd, like, I'd really appreciate that opportunity, and I, and I hope the, uh, the listeners do too. Oh, I think but they like, will just, as well. Just to, to, you know, before we go uh, very quickly, you know, to that point of, of understanding that difference or, or appreciating that there is this thing here, one of the things that always gets me is, is you know, Netflix is the darling of, of, uh, of, the, of the public in the States and, and the stock exchange and stuff. We have, I think, at the moment, there's like 230 Netflixes here, right? right? And that, that's, you know, that, that alone, just the fact that you, there is one, we have 230 here. Um, we have 230 of them of equal or larger size, both in content and users, right. um, or in revenue generated. But there are also 230 of them all from a technology perspective and a use perspective and a function perspective a million times more efficient, uh, a million times easier to use, a million times more consumer friendly. Um, that Understanding that, and that's just for something very simple like a Netflix, extrapolate that out for every single other right. sector, technology, tool, platform, product, and that's what we're dealing with here. Right. Um, so the, the opportunity to, to see what the future looks like is an opportunity that, you know, through all, all the ages of man, we have fought wars for, um, for basically a, a prescience or a sense of clairvoyance. The world right now has that opportunity on their doorstep to see what the future is going to look like by simply looking at what's here. Exactly. What's here is basically the building blocks for what's out there. And that's, I guess, the, the net net of the, of the thesis of the fund um, of Hotel Capital. Um, and, you know, I, I really... Really appreciate your chance to, to have a chat with you again, online or offline, about the, those uh, those macro themes that um, that we're following through there. Yeah, let's do it online. Look, this has really been amazing, <laughs> and I hope you had as much fun as I did. But let's let's agree to do this Dude, online, great. and let's um, when we're done doing Absolutely. this, we'll cancel this. I mean, not cancel. We'll stop this conversation here, and then I yeah. just want to say thank you. But then when we're done doing this, let's talk again for a few more minutes, if you don't mind. Thank you so Absolutely. much, Jeffrey. Absolutely. Yeah. I appreciate. Thank you very much for your time, and I uh, hope the uh, I hope the listeners uh, appreciate uh, something out of this. Please, if anyone uh, wants to get in touch, uh, agree, disagree, or would like to call me names or get more information about uh, what we've talked about today or about the fund itself, please uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, it's probably the easiest, or obviously WeChat for me uh, on WeChat. Uh, GJ Handley um, on LinkedIn, Jeffrey Handley, uh, and you can get in touch uh, with me and my team uh, for anything. Thank you very much for having me today. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.